Jerome Savonarola, Part 4 Chapter 20 The Attack on St. Mark's, Arrest of the Friar Events now rushed to their conclusion. Many of the supporters of Savonarola were disappointed. They had hoped, and indeed believed, that he would enter the fire and come out unscathed, to the confusion of his enemies. The Arabiati and the Compagnacci, seeing the hesitation of those in power, who still clung to the fallen prior, redoubled their vicious efforts, determined to strike the first blow, to shed the first blood. Alone with God, Savonarola passed the evening of the ordeal. His great heart must have known the depths of agony, as wave after wave of doubt, of regret, of disappointment, of humiliation, of cruelest ingratitude, swept over his soul, engulfing him as in a sea of woe. The next day was Palm Sunday. He made a short address in the morning. Seeming to realize the catastrophe that was impending, he again proclaimed his readiness to die, to seal with his blood the purity, the truth, the honor, the glory of the doctrine he had preached, and the life he had lived. His enraged and already triumphant enemies took him at his word. The Compagnacci precipitated a quarrel with some of the Piagnoni. They prevented a Dominican from speaking in the cathedral, and this outrage they followed by brutally killing two unoffending men whom they had met on the street. Then the murderous ruffian, ruffians rushed to St. Mark's, as, and as the friars were chanting vespers, on the inoffensive worshippers, men, women, and children, the cowardly and sacrilegious wretches rained a storm of stones. In terror the people fled, bruised, wounded, many of them trampled under foot in their mad effort to gain the street. Quickly were the doors of the church and convent barred, while a small band, thirty in number, of determined men remained within, resolved to defend the house of God and the brethren. Unknown to Savonarola, a few shields and muskets had been stored in the convent cellar by some of his friends, in view of the anticipated attack. On seeing the warlike preparations for defense, he forbade all violence and declared that he would surrender himself to avoid bloodshed. His wishes were disregarded by some of the brethren as well as by the laymen. Neither would they permit him to depart. For several hours the contest was waged with obstinacy on the part of the besiegers, with great courage on the part of the handful of defenders. In cloister, in corridors, in choir, and in church, the fight was sustained. From the altar and the pulpits, Gunshots rang out, while crucifix and candlestick were seized as ready weapons by the friars whom Savonarola could not restrain, resolved as they were to protect their home and to sell their lives as brave men. To the shame of the government no help was sent the beleaguered convent. Rather were the rioters encouraged, while their partisans flocked to their aid. The noble Valori, Savonarola's ever loyal friend, was cut down in the street while on his way to gather reinforcements for the convent, and a few minutes later his wife was foully assassinated by the infuriated rabble, who then sacked his house. Even these murders did not move the signory to punish the guilty. On the contrary, they sent several orders to the convent, demanding that the innocent defenders lay down their arms, and finally that Savonarola and the fathers Dominic and Sylvester should be arrested. The parting of the prior from his brethren 
from the living, the dead, and the dying defenders of his beloved St. Mark's, which he was to leave, alas, forever, was a scene of tenderness, resignation, courage, religion. Late at night, bound and surrounded by a howling mob that heaped insults, imprecations, and blows on him, the fallen leader was dragged to prison. In an adjoining cell, Father Dominic was placed. On the following day, Father Sylvester was arrested and brought to share their confinement. Misleading reports were sent to the Signori. Various courts, and to Alexander, a petition was also addressed, craving absolution for the bloody and sacrilegious work that had been done, asking permission to try the ecclesiastics, and, like cunning but overreaching politicians, they added their former request that they might be authorized to tax churches. These worthy sons of the Holy Church, to the sacrilegious cowards and murderers, greeting came with permission to try, which meant that in that cruel age to torture the poor prisoners. Alexander added that the condemned should be sent to him for punishment. Of course judgment had already been passed. Their condemnation was assumed and assured. The Pope granted nothing as to the church taxes. At the same time, at the same time, tidings came of the death of Charles the Eighth, the miserable ending of the French monarch on the very day of the ordeal by fire, removed Savonarola's last earthly hope. Twenty one, trial and torture. The trial of Savonarola and his companions was a mockery an outrage on justice, whose merest forms were preserved to cover and, if possible, to legalize a premeditated judicial murder. Papers stolen from the sacked convent gave no evidence against the prior, nor could any incriminating testimony be secured through the numerous arrests that followed the incarceration of the friars. The dastardly attempt of the captain of the Compagnacci to rouse the people against Savonarola by conveying through the streets some of the weapons that had figured in the storming of St. Mark's met with considerable success. The discredited and imprisoned champion of their liberty was held up to them as a despoiler of their freedom, as a violent despot, as the stupid ungrateful multitude believed the cruel lie, and loudly clamored for the death of the man who had spent himself for them. Florentine customs, intended to safeguard accused persons, were ruthlessly set aside, while the laws that might have served as a barrier against the conspirators were as recklessly trampled underfoot. On the 14th of April, though Savonarola's torture began on the ninth, when he was first brought to the council hall, a new, irregular, illegal court was organized, composed of Savonarola's sworn enemies, at the head the infamous leader of the Campanacci. The determination to convict was evident, no matter what the cost in fraud, outrage, perjury, or even torture. We shall not linger over agonizing details. The summary of the proceedings will be sufficient. Broken with illness and labor, his originally delicate constitution having yielded to the austerities and toils which he had imposed on himself, Savonarola was led before his judges. He had already been questioned in an informal way. Again, according to the brutal code of the time, the torture was applied. Fiendish Indians, dancing in savage joy around their scalped victim, deserve our applause when contrasted with the civilized legislators of those days, who disgraced Christianity and humanity by their ingenious cruelty in dealing with accused persons. Insulted, outraged, 
The prisoner, well nigh exhausted by the terrible experience of the previous few days, was bound to the rope and pulley, and having been lifted and suddenly dropped, his poor body was stretched till the bones and muscles were racked. While in this condition, he was questioned. The charges were under three heads of faith, prophecies, politics. The inhumanity of the examination by torture seems almost incredible. Yet these men were Christians, and their victim was a holy priest who had conferred the most precious benefits upon them and their people. Savonarola's answers were in part clear, and again they were unsatisfactory. In fact, he raved amid his agonizing cries to God that his soul might be delivered. Released from his bonds, he was ordered to write his declaration. He complied. The paper, however, was destroyed. It did not suit the evil purpose of his persecutors because it told only the truth. Relegated to his lonely cell, he was left to endure the sufferings of a wretched, wrenched, and lacerated frame, as well as the sorrow that must have filled his soul on realizing how abandoned and betrayed he was. With true religious spirit he prayed for his cruel enemies. In the meantime a wretch named Sicconi, who had received much kindness from Savonarola, which he was repaid by acting as a spy for the Duke of Milan, offered his services, though the law debarred him as secretary for the judges, guaranteeing that he would produce a deposition that would be effective. This traitor and perjurer was engaged. In a few days the trial was resumed. For eleven days it continued, during which time we cannot state how often Savonarola was put to the torture. But, as one eyewitness declared, he received on a certain day fourteen turns of the pulley. Hot coals were applied to the soles of his feet, and yet the infamous judges declared that he freely confessed and was not under restraint of any kind. On only one count did he waver in his examination. His judges pressed the point as to prophecies, with great vehemence, but beyond a certain vagueness, a want of absolute conviction on his part, they could secure no evidence. On politics he was firm, even in his delirium. On religion nothing could shake him at any time. He was no longer asked or allowed to write. Sicconi made all the notes as the examination proceeded, and subsequently he made a draft that was a tissue of forgeries, to which he secured the name of Savonarola, having first deceived him by reading the correct report, and then passing to him the one falsified, which he was directed to sign. Assuredly a diabolical plot. Nevertheless, even this mutilated document did not contain sufficient to justify his death. Rather did it establish his innocence. The traitorous secretary had signally failed in his endeavor. Three days later the baffled conspirators put the prior to a second trial, again changing and distorting the depositions. This examination lasted four days, but its results were even more disappointing to his judges than were of the first trial. Though the populace was perplexed, many saw clearly through the dishonest and illegal work of the senatory and its corrupt judicial tools. On April the 26th, Father Dominic and Father Sylvester were summoned before the court. The former, ever loyal, ever heroic, if imp imprudent and impulsive at times, was the first to be subjected to the torture. Pulley and rack and iron boot were all used, but his splendid courage never failed. He even showed himself staunch against the villainous attempts made to weaken him through the false statements of his torturers, that Savonarola had acknowledged himself an impostor and a false prophet. He wrote his deposition, and it also was distorted. 
Again and again they racked the, his poor body, but his undaunted spirit they could not break. Noble soul, worthy of a noble leader. Father Sylvester failed under the torture. A weak man, who had not deserved the consideration shown him by Savonarola, he yielded under the agony of the rack, and not only betrayed the names of the laymen who were the friends of St. Mark's, but even aspersed the character of the prior. Other friars and laymen were tortured, but nothing substantial resulted from the examinations that could incriminate Savonarola. On the contrary, despite the forgeries of Sicconi, the prior's innocence was more clearly established as a consequence of these trials. During these days, the sorrow he languished in his cell, all communication with his brethren or with counsellors having been interdicted, according to another delicate requirement of that refined period. While the helpless prior was suffering the agony of examination, the friars of St. Mark's, with few exceptions, also turned against him. Their petition to the Pope is a document that strangely contradicts their former life in conversation. They might have justly sought absolution, but it was not necessary for them to slander their prior, thus offering another lesson of ingratitude more strong than traitors' arms. In the meantime, the Pope and Signory were engaged in correspondence, the former demanding the surrender to him of Savonarola, the latter claiming the right of a sovereign state to execute condemned citizens, and adding, hypocritically, the specious pretext that, for example's sake, for the welfare of religion, the malefactor should be punished in the place where his notorious crimes had been committed. The unfortunate victim was held by the Florentines as a sort of price, in the hope of extorting from Alexander the ecclesiastical tax privilege that they had so often requested, and for which Savonarola himself had so generously striven. This must have been as the iron in his soul, but he spoke no word of impatience or resentment. Twenty two in solitary confinement from April twenty fifth till May nineteenth, Savonarola had been kept in solitary confinement. In this interval, much has been accomplished. A new scenery had been elected, even more determined in its malignity than the retiring board. Papal commissioners were dispatched to Florence to preside at the closing scenes, for by this time, May 11th, the death of the victims was considered as assured beyond any chance of mishap. On May 19th, two papal commissioners, Father Joachim Turiano, Master General of the Dominicans, and Dr. Francis Romolino, a Spanish bishop, afterwards cardinal, arrived in Florence. A Dominican prelate named Paganotti, bishop of Vassona, and apparently an auxiliary of the archbishop of Florence, was designated by Alexander to degrade the friars and then hand them over to the secular power. The very dregs of the people, as Valari writes, flocked around the commissioners as they entered the city, shouting, Death to the Friar! Bishop Romolino, in a spirit at least unbecoming to his office, if not to his episcopal character, answered, Surely he will die. We may therefore credit the statements of Berlamacci, that letters had been received in Florence declaring that these commissioners had been instructed to put Savonarola to death, even were he another, John the Baptist, and that Romolino, later in the day, brutally declared, We shall have a great bonfire, for I have the sentence already prepared. 
Never in human affairs was there a viler prostitution of justice. Never was there a more infamous outrage in the name of the law. We shall add, and we shall add, in the name of religion. Let us return to the lonely prisoner in the tower, and to his two companions. During the time of their incarnation the three friars had been kept in close and solitary confinement. The legislation and jurisprudence of those days, as applied in courts and prisons, might well have been devised, as was said of the English penal laws against Ireland, by the arch-enemy of men and in infernal regions. Suspicion and superstition were in the air, nor was their influence upon laymen only. Father Dominic's red cope, his habit, his crucifix, were objected to on the day of the ordeal because of probable enchantment, a subtle force that his religious opponents also claimed might assert itself because of his standing near the Dominicans. And so, cope and habit and crucifix having been put away, the friar himself was ordered to stand apart. It was this narrow, unchristian spirit, bred in the lingering barbarism and paganism that prevailed among the Florentine authorities in their treatment of the noble prisoner and his companions. Fortunately, the torture had not entirely disabled his right hand, a hand that had never been lifted except in zealous warning or fatherly blessing. And so he spent the waiting hours in writing beautiful commentaries on the thirtieth and fiftieth psalms. In thee, O Lord, have I hoped, and have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy. No complaint, no word of impatience, no countercharge, no defense, no expression that outraged innocence might not unreasonably have put forth, found its way into these writings. Only the soundest Catholic doctrine, the truest principles of the spiritual life, can be found in these tracts, the last legacy of the silenced preacher, and who could, throw, who could now speak only with his eloquent pen. In the commentaries on the 50th Psalm, some have pretended to find the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone without good works. We shall dispose of this libel in another place. These treatises were rapidly disseminated, and were justly regarded with peculiar veneration. Another instance of Savonarola's zeal and generous spirit we find in the service rendered to his jailer. This poor man, seeing with eyes unprejudiced, and from a heart in which no lurking hatred had left its poison, felt the goodness, the holiness, of the prisoner whose keeper he was. As a memorial that he would cherish, he begged Savonarola to write something for him. Without paper, having only the cover of a book, the prior wrote on this, in his wonderfully fine hand, a rule for virtuous living, in which he summed up, as a conclusion, the essentials of sacramental grace in good works. Thus, in these hours of pain and solitude, he dwelt with God, and thought only of his coming death as a release from earthly sorrow, and as an entrance to heavenly joys. Father Dominic and even Father Sylvester also manifested a true religious and courageous spirit during these trying days. Twenty three The Execution of Savonarola On May twentieth, Savonarola was taken before the papal commissioners for renewed torture and a third examination. The infamous Sicconi, assisted by other scribes worthy of his companionship in fraud and distortion, was present to record the prisoner's answers, and then to falsify them. 
This so-called third trial was even more cruel and shameful mockery of law than were the preceding examinations. Now religion presided in name, but in fact, alas, the, la the affair was a cowardly attempt by Florentine politicians to justify, in a legal fashion, a prearranged plan, a judgment already determined. Abominable questions were put to this tortured prior regarding his personal life. His acknowledged virtues had anticipated such questions in completest repudiation. As to the counsel for which he had hoped, he spoke bravely. On, on no Italian potentates had he relied, for they were his enemies, and in the same category he placed the cardinals and other prelates. Rendered delirious by the torture, again he raved, and spoke of the cardinal of Naples, as one cognizant of his plans. But on the return of reason he recalled his statement. In the same noble spirit he abjured the denials that pulley and rope had before wrung from his wandering mind and helpless tongue. We contemplate with sentiments of pity the spectacle of those judges as they gazed, unmoved, on the prisoner now almost insane from pain, broken in body, and, as he held up his shattered arm, piteously crying out for mercy to Jesus, whom he thought he had denied. He had faltered during the previous trials on the matter of the prophecies. He had denied that he possessed any supernatural endowment in the way of prophecy, but before his judges he now asserted what he felt to be the truth, and grievously deplored the weakness which had led him, as he too strongly put it, to deny God. On the 21st and 22nd, he was also tortured and examined. Promises alternated with threats, but he could not be shaken. His malignant judges attempted to frame a document embodying the falsified depositions of this third trial. Despite this fraudulent paper, without signature or witness, despite the ingenuity of Siccone and a band of citizens who sought, by surprise, an interview with the prior in his prison cell, hoping to entrap him in his words. The conspirators realized that they had no plea or justification in law that could be offered to the public. The barbarous work of six weeks of torture and forgery had only one clear result. The innocence of the illustrious prisoner was made more manifest. On the third day of the examination by the papal commissioners, the 22nd, the sentence, already resolved on, was formally decreed. Death by hanging, the bodies afterwards to be burned. On the same evening the three friars heard their fate. They were condemned to be executed early on the morrow. Atrocious speed! but an evil deed, even as that of Judas, should be done quickly. The timid Sylvester received the tidings with great agitation. Dominic was full of joy. Savonarola manifested no feeling. He had already passed beyond the influence of earthly hope or fear. Only one word now would he speak, and that was to the member who came from the company of the temple, an organization instituted for the solace of the dying. Through him the prior sought the favor of communicating with his two brethren. To this good man he also revealed, in a prophetic spirit, that woe would come upon the church in Florence when a pope named Clement would sit in Rome. And so it happened a generation later. Savonarola's request for an interview was reluctantly granted by the Signory. In the hall of the Ground Council the prior met his two spiritual sons. The hour went quickly by, nor on its sacredness may we intrude, though its beautiful lesson we shall note. The night wore away, and the lovely May morning, in the glad Paschal time, 
the eve of the ascension, broke with a freshness and life that, to the weary victims, seemed but as a dawn of an everlasting day, the promise of their ascension from the veil of tears. All made a devout confession and were absolved. The prior was allowed to celebrate Mass. From his hands the two companions received the bread of life. His profession of faith, in which they also joined, was a declaration of Catholic doctrine expressed in tender and touching words. Then, bare foot and head, with hands bound, the three were led out. The scaffold had been erected, but for the bishop, whose duty it was to degrade the ecclesiastics, for the papal commissioners, and for the lay judges, places had been respectively arranged. The surrender of the scapular was the first demand made upon the three friars. As the distinctive mark of his habit, this deprivation was a severe trial for Savonarola, but he yielded bravely through with aching heart. I do not forsake thee, O holy scapular, he said, gift of God, which I have ever kept without stain. How, long, how I long to wear thee to the end! But now I am bereft of thee. The work of degrading the friars followed next. I separate thee, the bishop said, addressing Savonarola, from the church militant and, he added incautiously, from the church, in tri the church triumphant. From the church militant, yes, replied Savonarola, but from the church triumphant, no, this does not belong to you. The degraded friars, clad only in their under tunics, were then passed to the papal commissioners, who pronounced condemnation against them for heresy and schism. Finally they were delivered to the secular authorities, the bench of judges, by whom the capital sentence was announced. On hearing the result, the mob shouted its insane approval, its virtuous conviction that the men thus humiliated were indeed guilty. It is easy, a well-known writer has said, to believe in the damnable state of a man who stands stripped and degraded. Then were seen the spirit of the leader and the docility of the two disciples, to the lessons of the last sad interview of the night before. On their bowed heads the words of absolution had fallen, and with reverence they had accepted the plenary, plenary indulgence granted. But no word was spoken by them except in prayer. Father Dominic's desire to be burned alive was no longer thought of. Father Sylvester's determination to declare his innocence was set aside. Previously he had recalled the untrue statements made by him under torture. Both loyally and religiously went to their death. As did their prior, silent, courageous, caring not for human justification, entirely resigned to the goodness of God. Savonarola was the last to be executed. Between his brethren his poor emaciated body swung suspended in ignominy while the flames leaped high to make perfect the holocaust, and while the fierce mod, mob, full of hate and gloating over the horrible spectre, melted away, while the wicked judges and politicians went back to plot and to continue their work of persecution against the Piagnoni, some of whom even when were eagerly and devoutly sharing relics of their loved prophet and guide, the ashes were rudely gathered up, by command of the magistrates, and having been carried to the river bank, were wantonly scattered on the flowing waters of the Arno. Pitiable triumph of political vengeance! Denied a tomb, the martyrs' memories were enshrined in the hearts of their faithful disciples. For more than two hundred years, on each recurring twenty-third of May, fragrant, fragrant flowers were tenderly brought by loving hands, and laid on a spot that to them was hollowed. 
Thus were treasured the fame and virtues of the great prior. The Medici, restored fourteen years after Savonarola's death, erected on the scene of his execution a magnificent fountain, in the vain hope that his name might be forgotten. Four hundred years have gone by, and, despite misunderstanding and cal calumny, the luster of his fame shines more gloriously than in the passing hour of his triumph. The storm of fierce passions which raged around him in life was forever subsided. Pope and prince and politician who shared in his career have passed before the bar of eternal justice, where an everlasting seal had been set on the judgment divinely rendered. And though the judgment of history has not been finally pronounced, the mists of prejudice have been dissipated by the Son of Truth, in whose clear lights of Honorola, with all his faults, stands forth, assuredly, a grand figure in the galaxy of the world's great men.